Thank you, Poncho Man. Welcome, everybody. Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. My name is Bob Babbitt. We're brought to you by Master Spas as fuels go longer. Hoka, let's fly. Form Smart Swim Goggles, Quintana Roo Zoot, the original triathlon brand, Premium Plus Sports, and of course, our Challenged Athletes Foundation. We've now raised over $150 million and sent out over 40,000 grants to challenged athletes in all 50 states, 73 countries, and for equipment, coaching, and training in 104 different sports. A young man I'm really looking forward to getting to chat with. His name is Freddie Ovet. Freddie, so nice to get to chat with you. How you doing? I'm good, mate. I'm a... Uh... Pretty, pretty surreal to hear that uh, poncho, man, introduction, man. I've been following your uh, your videos for many years, so uh, stoked to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, and I'm, I'm stoked because I followed your dad for many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, long time and that ago. Was a, that was a great era of, uh, of running with your dad and Sebastian Coe and John Walker and Rod Dixon and Right. So, but you grew up as is more of a runner, right? Didn't you run at Oregon for a bit? Yeah, I was. I was a runner more or less since I was eight years old. Um, right, 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 the right way through to twenty uh, years old, and uh, yeah, I ran at Oregon for a year. Um, I feel like people are hearing this story more and often about the you know the ex runner turned cyclist picked up an injury, rehabbed on the bike, found they were fast, and uh, continued on, and that's that's more or less my story to be honest. Yeah. Well, and that's, it's not just for the elite guys. We see it with, you know, your age group athlete. I, I think oh. the re, the orthopedic reality, you get to 50 years old, you're not running faster and you yeah. better start mixing in some cycling and swimming <laughs> if you want to continue to so, be an endurance athlete. So the running's hard, isn't it? You know, it's, it's not, it's, it breaks down your body and, and beauty of, the beauty of cycling is you have this metal object on the, on beneath you that, that can carry you when you're suffering a bit so it's it's a great rehab tool and uh i've, I've managed to turn it into my profession while I, was, while I was at it so when you started out riding a bike and you're doing it for rehab when did you get to the point where you thought you know i'm pretty good at this maybe i'll jump yeah, into a couple races pretty quickly actually i'm i'm, I'm uh, the sort of guy that likes to go full on with anything and i got straight into the bunch riding scene which is huge in, the, in australia um and all the best sort of local pros would hop on those rides. And I was doing really well without really realizing it. I think one day someone kind of pulled me aside and said, Hey mate, you know, like these guys are pretty good and and what you're doing is not really normal. And maybe you should consider this and jumped in a few races and strangely enough had some immediate success, which is not normal in cycling just due to the technicality of the bikes. Um, and before I knew it, I was uh, I was over with uh, the Agile Desert development team in France, uh, more or less my first year cycling. And uh, yeah, I've been based in Europe ever since. So uh, here we are. I love it. And, you, and when I look at all the different teams, you starting in 2014 and going through 2018 with BMC and then 2019 with the Is Israel Cycling Academy and then yeah. Legions of LA connecting yeah, with yeah. those guys. So I love that program that they're doing up there. Talk yeah. a little about connecting with those guys and deciding that's where you want to be. Yeah. So I, I as you said, I, I rode with a couple of pro teams there and um, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but as we know, the European scene and the world tour scene constantly is changing with the uh, teams and sponsor setups and how they uh, choose to fulfill their rosters. And I was in a bit of a tricky time on both of those teams um, when i got asked to join bmc it actually turned out to be their final year as a as a team and then i joined israel um, at a time when they were transitioning between a pro conti team to a world tour team and, and signing the likes of uh, chris Froome and greipel and these legendary guys so i kind of got caught in between periods there and it made me think about um, alternative options and and teams that really aligned with who I am as an athlete and, and gave me a bit more freedom to to race events like gravel and esports. And Legion uh put their hand up and we started talking. And yeah, before I knew it, I was I was racing stateside and um been with them two years now and just love the freedom that I have just to kind of do whatever race I want 
um, across all sorts of terrains and uh, even sports. Now I've jumped back into running a little bit and um, just just enjoying it. And I'm very privileged to to be able to have this freedom. I know that's not normal, but um, trying to give back as much as I can to the to the community and and just raise awareness that that you can uh, be very good at your job whilst uh, being able to enjoy other facets of uh, sport in general. So e, uh, you you get a silver right in the esport e, e world, <laughs> which yes. is so cool. In, in the, uh, to, a, to a quite fast uh, Jay Vine, who's currently uh, dominating the welter. So um, yeah, I, I'll take second to him at the moment. <laughs> you'll take second to him at the moment, and then you're doing gravel, and then you yep. jump into LA Marathon. I think with like 48 hours notice, and run 248.55. And, yeah. and I've, I've always felt that there's. You know, if more high school and college cross country teams and track teams had trainers, bike trainers on the track that you 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 can use those bikes to to, you know, to tune up the machine and use the totally. engine without the pounding. Do you exactly. feel how much running did you do before jumping in and running a 248? Oh, uh, not much. Honestly, I, I, I would enjoy a, a morning 20 minute jog with my girlfriend once or twice a week throughout throughout that year. It was just a, a nice way for me to start my day. Um, that L.A. Marathon was um, really meant to be uh, just a, an insane challenge. Uh, I like to I like to set myself a crazy challenge kind of yeah. end of season. And it and it worked out that I was at a, a Criterion Race with Legion at the Lions Den. And one of our sponsors is a big running guy. And I uh, just was speaking to him in the lobby one day. I said, oh, you know, what are you up to this weekend? He said, oh, I'm actually helping out at the LA Marathon. We're, we're helping sponsor it. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it'd be fun. And he's like, oh, you ever thought about running a marathon? I said, yeah, what, what about this one? <laughs> and he thought I was joking. And I was like, no, nah, mate, like it would be fun to to walk slash jog and, and be able to see LA on foot and uh, just experience what it is what it takes to complete a marathon it was always a challenge I had in the back of my mind. And it went a lot better than I thought it would. And I found a nice pack to run with and felt great and had a great day and had no uh, uh, cramping or anything like that, which I saw quite a lot of people having. Um so yeah, definitely got away with murder there, but I, I, I then from that got the got the bug and the idea to to continue trying doing one uh, at the end of every year, and um, here we are, um, three and a half weeks away from Berlin. I've, I've definitely run a little bit more, um, so I, I think I'm in a lot better position to uh, enjoy the sightseeing of Berlin. And, so uh, is, is the goal is what in the two thirty somewhere? I don't, you know. Want goals? I don't know. I don't know. I'm 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 imagining I should run quite a bit faster, and I, I'm I'm very much a feel athlete. I don't like looking at uh, paces or anything. So I'm gonna set off, uh, find a group, and settle in, and and uh, really uh, listen to my body. And um, the goal is to finish uh without injury or pain, because at the end of the yes. day, I'm a professional cyclist, and I <laughs> I can't um, jeopardize that. So. I want to have a good experience whilst trying to run pretty quick at the same time. So um, I'm going to have to listen to my body on that one and not really put any uh, goals in place, just a general idea. So, so growing up here, you've got, you know, your dad's a gold medalist in 1980, 800 meters, set five world records, won 45 consecutive 1500 mile races between <laughs> 1977 and 1980. I mean, I'm talking a legend. Then your uncle, Nikovet competed in the luge at 88 92 winter olympics that's a, that's something to live up to man it's like as a kid yeah. were you, did, did you feel an obligation to get in the sport like oh this is sort of my heritage i better figure out what i'm going to do i wouldn't uh first thing i would say is my parents were always super supportive and i think a lot of people would think that you know uh, when when your parents have a huge background in a sport that that you they therefore want you to do that sport and especially if someone's doing well, there's that immediate thought like, oh, you know, his dad must be a bit pushy. Uh, it was quite the opposite. I think he realized how hard of a sport athletics is and that it's not the same as it used to be. And only really the top guys get well supported financially. And, um, but I was hell bent from a young age of being a professional runner. Um, and I, I think purely that was because I just had immediate success as a junior. I, I would more or less win every race I did. And, 
you know, for an eight, nine, 10, 11 year old kid, winning is a, is a very nice feeling, you know, when you're walking around the school ground. So, uh, I got used to winning and I, I wanted to continue winning, but, uh, unbeknownst to myself, I, I was definitely dealing with a lot of stress and pressure as a young kid and um, trying to live up to that uh, name put on only by myself. Right. Um, and yeah, I would say definitely in certain races that it, it would catch up to me. Um, so I, I was just one of those kids that was just way more motivated than he needed to be. Um, but that's not always a bad thing. And, and it did lead to a professional career, but just in a different sport. <laughs> so what races are you doing right now? Or is it a training camp? So I just did Steamboat Gravel uh, two weeks ago in, in Steamboat, Colorado, and I, I finished second there to um, Keegan Swinson. Um, nice. Yeah, in a, in a, in a tight sprint, sprint finish. So that was a good one for me. Um, and then this Sunday, I'm racing the Maryland Classic. It's a new race. A um, bunch of World Tour teams are showing up, uh, EF and Bike Exchange and a few other ones. So that's a new race, which should be fun. And then I fly back to Europe and uh, buckle down for Berlin. And two weeks after that, so hopefully I recover well, I've got the, the Grapple World Championships in uh, Tuscany. So um, Talk about know. a sport catching fire in a short period of time. Right. Gravel right. is freaking yes. crazy. It's, uh, I mean, how long ago did you get in the gravel? Because it's not like it's been around that long. Yeah, I I uh, I joined Legion and I didn't know really much about gravel at all, but I would spend my winter periods riding on gravel with my good friend Nathan Hatz. And mm. I learned to just feel the way gravel moved beneath the bike. And I, I got a very good understanding of it without realizing that it would be something that I would be racing on. And I came to the US and immediately I came across the gravel scene just for a friend of mine. And straight away, I was like, I need to do this and I need to do it seriously because I could see the whole, it was like a marathon I, culture you know you had the expos the day before mass starts you're standing on the same start line as someone who's just trying to finish the event and i was like i i really like this and i think it's the future of american uh bike racing and potentially world bike racing um so i got myself to the bigger races and did quite well without much preparation and this year i put a little bit more preparation and did really well and next year i'm looking at even putting even more into it and and being the best guy so um I think it's great. Uh, it's great for all our partners and sponsors, you know, um, in, you know, specialize, uh, you know, making specific bikes and tires and shoes now. So it's, it's great for everyone. And, and honestly, they're just a hell of a fun time, you know, before and after and during that they're just a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm really stoked to be a part of them. You know, what's cool about it. It's for years. It's been, if you wanted to make a living as a cyclist, you had to go to Europe. Right, mm. you, you on the roads. You had the, the the U.S. scene was sort of a starter league, and then you went over to ride with the. You know, if you wanted to be one of the best, you had to ride over there. Well, yes. now with the growth of gravel and so many of the tour riders coming and doing gravel, the U.S. is it could be one a major factor in gravel moving forward. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and, and it's about bloody time to be honest that that there was opportunity for Americans to to stay home and and have their own racing scene. You know, it's a big enough country obviously there's enough uh funding here um to support these athletes and these types of races so um i'm sure we never thought that it would come in the form of gravel um but it has and here it yeah. is and you know there's plenty of guys making very good um, salaries and enough to live good healthy lives and prepare well for these races and I think any way we can offer young athletes to be inspired to to race professionally, whether that's in Europe or now the US, then that's great. So I'm all for it. Well, in the business model, if you think about what's been successful in the US, it's been you know marathons, triathlons, uh, less so cycling because cycling has always been pro only, right? Exactly. In Europe, it's pro only. Yeah. There really isn't yeah. that age group component, but where do the dollars come from? The dollars come right. from the age groupers. Yeah, so right. over the years, when I'd go out to tour California or other events, I'm sitting there going, this is great that we've got this time trial going on, but there's no dollars being exchanged here. People are bringing their brown bag with their lunch and they're sitting on a curb and watching people time trial, but there's no age groupers. There's no exactly. dollars coming in. It's, yeah. it's not, it doesn't make financial sense. Now you make a great point. Like the tour de France for people that have never been to France, it's always like this far fetched, like, 
wonderland race that you're not sure if even it exists in real life you know you, right. you see it on tv and it's like wow the, these guys are amazing and they're they're doing incredible power and they're riding so fast but it's not really relatable to the average person uh, in you know riding down a pyrenean descent at 100 kilometers an hour it's fantastic to watch but in terms of uh people getting into the sport it's not exactly inspiring in the sense that they think they can do that one day Whereas, like you mentioned, an Ironman or a steamboat gravel race, anyone can sign up. You, yeah. you know, a marathon, you you say, look, I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to figure out a way to be in shape in order to complete it. And you show up and uh, for Berlin Marathon example, you might be, you're probably, you're going to be on the same start line as Ellie Kipchoge, who's trying to run two hours. Yeah. But there's guys back there who are just trying to finish and run four or five hours. But it doesn't matter because you're all doing the same thing and you're all going through uh, the same journey just in different speeds. And it's the people at the back that help fund the people at the front to be who they are. And that's what Gravel is doing at the moment. Mass participation for me is everything in terms of a successful business model and Gravel have got it. And I'm, I just think it's so cool. And how do you do you train differently for gravel and for the road? Honestly, not really. No, um, I I think once you have the feeling of of the gravel and and the gravel bike, then um, the most easiest way to do productive training is on the road bike because you can ride further. There's more people to train with, and you can uh, use the the smoothness of the of the tarmac to to lay down good power in intervals. Um, but it's uh, it's a nice tool to to go out on once or twice a week and then just enjoy yourself and be be surrounded by trails and all those all those nice sort of areas that uh, runners and, and people like that enjoy as well. And it's safe. That's the other thing. Yeah, if you if you, exactly. if you if you if you fall down, that's on you. But you're yeah, not getting hit by cars out there. That yeah, makes a, a huge that's a, difference. That's a great point. And and we always hear those horrible stories every year of of um of nasty accidents and um you know any way you can encourage people to be in safer environments on the bike is is definitely something i'm all for so you're right you're, you're away from cars which is a huge plus so cameron Worth coming from team Ineos, getting fifth in kona obviously mm -hmm. amazing bike background taught himself to run you're a runner you're a cyclist you like doing audacious things <laughs> you can Here sort of see where this is going you see yourself yeah, jumping in is one of your off season audacious goals, jumping into a, a 70.3 or an Ironman. Mate, it's funny you say that because every time I put up a picture of me running uh, or something on Instagram, the majority of the comments are, why don't you do triathlon? What, how does your swim? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and <laughs> it, 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 to be annoyed, to be honest, it cracks me to to read those comments but it's like mate why can't i just run and enjoy running and the fact that i do cycling but it's a fair question um the answer is i can swim i'm, I'm australian and i grew up next to the beach um anyone everyone can swim in australia yeah um then the next point of that is uh, i don't enjoy it if i'm completely honest i, I can't see myself waking up and di diving into a cold swimming pool and, and swimming for two hours every day of my life i just not sure I can do it. Um, and I feel like every triathlete I speak to also doesn't enjoy swimming. Um, so for too now. Too solitary, I'm, right? Yeah, it's too, you're by yourself. Yeah. You just got a lane line. Ocean is know. great. Jumping Ocean's in the ocean. Fun. Look, I, I never rule anything out. Um, I can obviously run and, and bike pretty well. The swim would take some serious convincing. And I'm, I also am a big believer in respecting uh, people uh, who do their domain very well and I'm a big fan of triathlon I follow it closely I know some of the guys I know how fast they swim and I think it would be a little bit arrogant of me to think that I could all of a sudden just pick it up and and get to a level where I can come out uh, even with guys like uh, Sanders and Sam Long yeah. I, I still would be a long way behind them uh, but you know never say never I'm 28 you, you never know but uh pretty happy just with the marathon uh, challenge at the end of the year for now so growing up did you when did you realize how big a deal your dad was oh very very early on i, I was a uh, one of those 
nerdy type uh athletes that knew everything i actually think i know more about his career than he does he 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 seems to forget everything you know it's like yeah dad do you remember you won the olympics he's like oh shit yeah i do remember that <laughs> <laughs> and, and you got a bronze the same year <laughs> yeah he he his memory is questionable at times but it, that kind of i think was what made him so good is that he was just so relaxed and so confident um, and just just didn't think uh uh, some of the things that he was doing was that big of a deal when it was clearly um so yeah i i knew very early on and it was a huge uh privilege slash um something i had above everyone else that i had this massive uh, wealth of knowledge um, behind me that i could always access um so yeah I'm a big fan of that era and running in general. I just think those guys were so cool. You know, John Walker, Dad, Seb Coe. Uh, all the, those guys. Yeah, Prefontaine, Dick Quacks. Like, those guys, were, they were so cool. And, and like, the things that they were running in, the shoes, the, the oh. short shorts. Yeah, they, they, those guys knew what was up. You know, so They were um, badasses. Yeah, they I, were. I love that. I love school. that era. You know, and what's cool about it is... <laughs> Your your dad and Sebastian Co. in seventeen years only raced seven times. Yeah, that's it's unbelievable. Kind of, it's kind of what makes it special, though, right? You know, like, absolutely. You know, I always asked Dad about that, and he would always say, like, "Why would we line up at like, I guess, what the equivalent of what they call now is a is a diamond league? Why yeah. would we line up there? Like, no one wants to see us race in you know Oslo or something. They want to see us go head to head at the big ones, the Olympics, and and that's." The build up to those events was so huge because they hadn't raced together. And nowadays we see, you know, uh, all the big guys going head to head uh, every weekend, uh, chasing, chasing the cash. And that's great. But there was a certain like romanticism back in those days where they would avoid each other and only show up when it mattered. And I think it's just great storytelling. So um, well, and the best part is that if you look at that Olympics 1980, they end up racing each other twice in six days, right? <laughs> After avoiding each other for, for years. Yeah. And then Seb, who was the, you know, your dad was the 1500 guy. Yeah. And, you know, he wins the eight and Seb was the 800 guy. <laughs> then, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was just, you yeah. Couldn't have scripted it, was like, it. You, yeah. You couldn't have scripted it. You couldn't have scripted it any better that, that exactly. uh, your dad, you know, your dad takes the, the eight and then Seb takes the 1500 is like, it's, it's crazy yeah. stuff. And I look at the, the, the just 348 mile and yeah. 813, two mile, 1325,000 on the shoes they're running in on yeah. cinder it's, tracks. It, and for a lot yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not really, uh, I mean, dad was a 330 guy and he, he would run the last sort of 900 meters of that alone. You know, uh, so yeah. you probably would think he could run sort of, I don't know, 327 at least, you know, in the shoes that they were running in, on the tracks they were running in. It, it really uh, is mind-blowing because guys like Jakob Ingebrigtsen are just breaking 330 with perfect pacemaking and these amazing shoes. And when you talk about, you know, oh, is he one of the greatest of all time? It's like, well, hang on, you know. Let's not forget about these guys 40 years ago. You know, Seb run 141 for the 800. There's only been a handful of guys who run that quick. So yeah. it, it's really, it was a special time in sport. And they also, the reality is it's it, it still was a small pie. You either won or you got, you know, you really got nothing. So really? they really couldn't be friends. It's not like they no. go out to eat. Uh, like no, John no, Walker no. and Dixon traveled together. They roomed together. Yeah. They kicked each other's yes. ass. Yeah, Dad they, was great friends with um, Johnny Walker. They they were they were good. They're good mates. buddies with Walker. But, uh, yeah. with Seb, it was like they were like different camps. You know, you were either a Seb guy or a Ovet guy, and uh, it had to be that way because it was just too big in the media, kind of like a you know Rafa Nadal and, and Federer sort of deal. Um, yeah. So yeah, we don't really have that in athletics anymore, and I and uh, or track and field, sorry. And I think that's what I think that's the the key to a. Uh, and then sort of lighting the imaginations of the public to, to get back interested in the sport. But it's not easy to find those personalities in the first place. And uh, I think it was amplified by the fact that they were both Brits as well from the same oh, country. Yeah. So it, it just couldn't have, couldn't have been any better. No. And rivalries are really, because most people don't understand our, our sport. They understand soccer. They understand basketball. They understand football. Same with the media, right? The media yes. guys are used to mainstream sports. The only time they really 
latch on to our sort of smaller sports triathlon with Mark Allen and Dave Scott or Aaron Baker right. and Paul Newby Frazier or Steve Ovette and Sebastian Coe. Rivalries really take yeah. a sport and elevate it to another level, exactly. especially yeah. when there's a sense that those people don't like each other. <laughs> yeah. That always helps. Yeah, whether it's it true or not. So uh, hopefully we can have a Blumenfeld Fredino battle in the next year or so and uh, as, as we're all craving. I would love that. Have, yeah. have you been in a room with your dad and Seb at the same time? Uh, I haven't. I've, I've, I've obviously been in many uh, different rooms with my dad, but uh, yeah. Seb, uh, I've met uh, a couple of times and yeah, lovely guy. Um, yeah. But to get those two in a room, even these days is uh, not easy. And probably a, a few, a uh, few dollars need to be thrown down as well. Um, exactly. but, uh, yeah. Those, they're, they're worlds apart now, down in Australia um, and, and Seb in the UK. And uh, I think they're pretty happy to to have that distance between them, I reckon. So what type, of, what type of mileage are you running? Are you on the track and, and doing some interval stuff? Uh, mate, uh, honestly, minimal. Um, I, I One thing I have included this week that I think is vital to a, to running a marathon, which is quite obvious, is, is a long run once a week. So I on Sundays, yep. I, I flicked uh, going out on the bike and I've included a run uh, anywhere between an hour um, now up to a couple hours. And I'm confident that's enough to at least um, train the – uh, the muscles for the final uh, 10 miles or so to not be completely uh, destroyed. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm, I'm not worried at all about the aerobic side of things. I know I've got that covered from, from the 20, 25 hours a week on the bike. Um, but yes, it's just a matter of me. It's like a safety net. Just, just do one uh, long run a week and make sure that um, your, your body at least has some sort of understanding of what's coming in a, a you know, in September. Uh, and, and the way I look at it is I did LA basically on nothing and got away with it. So I'm in a far better position as a, uh, uh, for Berlin than I was for LA. <laughs> Any of the uh, Legion of LA guys jump in and go, oh, running, that looks like sort of fun. Or they yeah, like, yeah, the, you the can reaction, have that. The reaction is uh, usually one of like, why are you, why are you doing that? Like, well, I, <laughs> you're a cyclist. Like, you don't, no one's making you doing that. No one's, you know, asking you to do that. And and uh, the, the answer is simple is that I just, I just really enjoy it. I, I love the running community. I love being able to run with people once or twice a week. Um, I'm obsessed with, as we spoke about, mass participation events. I just think they're so cool in the atmosphere, the days before and after. So much fun. And they're, they're just addictive. And I, I did LA and I was, I was straight away like, I've got to do this every year. And um, I don't think you can explain that to someone in, in, until they do it. And and then they're like, all right, now I get it. So um, I, my girlfriend's coming along for the journey this year. And I, and I keep telling her, just, just wait until you're standing on that start line and surrounded by thousands of people doing the same thing. It's, it's special. It really is. Yeah. And the other special part is, I mean, obviously you sort of know uh, what times you're going to run, how you're going to do, where the average person who's been training for their first ever marathon has lost 40 pounds. And mm -hmm. when they get to that finish line and you see the emotion come out, right? you really get a feel of how important it's a good point. Yeah. This stuff is. The the lives that we live as professional athletes are, are, is very small. Uh, it's a very small space and a, a space that no one really can understand because it's so elitist. And we we only look at races and results through the the magnifying glass of of doing well and and podiums and and fast times and and this and that. But when you take a step back and and just join the the field back there and start at two hundredth place and and just get through it and enjoy the the event for what it is. You you really have a different perspective on these events, and it makes you really just appreciate that we're all just out there in a pair of short shorts and 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 singlet, just just running through the streets of a major city, just trying to achieve something and and being healthy. And that's just beautiful. I think I think that's just really special, and and it really refreshes my my love for being a professional cyclist and. And gives me appreciation that I get to do it uh, as a job. Best thing must be when you get off the plane and go, 
oh wait, I've got my shoes. <laughs> I don't need to wait for a bike. I don't yes. need to <laughs> yes. I mean, travel. That, that is... Running is the simplest thing in the yeah. whole world. It's a great point you make, Bob, there's been many times where my bike's been lost or um, I finished a hard race and I just don't feel like hopping on the bike that next day because you, you had such a hard day. And running is just this outlet that, yeah, I can do it with my girlfriend. I can do it by myself. I can run with some faster people. And it doesn't matter that you, you do it for 20, 30 minutes minimal. And, and you feel like you've, you've been out on the bike for two hours and you just completely refresh. There's, there's nothing that beats the feeling of that post, uh, post run for sure. What, what's your dad think about you getting back into running? Yeah, he was, he was definitely questionable at first, very much so like you're going to hurt yourself, be careful. And then um, slowly but surely, he he saw how much it meant to me and how much I was enjoying it. And um, it, I spoke to him last night actually about Berlin and he's really excited for it as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's nice that we can uh, bond over that as well. Um, once again. He's going to start yeah. critiquing your running and go, what the hell Always. are you doing? Is Always. he following you online and going, hey, what what were you yeah, thinking between yeah. mile 15 and 17? He saw me, uh, he saw a video of me running the other day. He's like, you're, you're bouncing too much. You know, you're not running the track anymore. You need to like, you know, and I was like, it's like, I'm just, just trying to run here, dad. You know, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> is your dad still running? Definitely not. No, he is well and truly retired. He's living at a, he's living on a beach in Noosa. I'm sure you know Noosa. Oh, oh yeah. Places. A lot of triathletes yeah. in Noosa. Yes. A lot of, lot of great people to hang out with there. Um, so he's he's got a pretty good setup there with a couple of dogs and and living at the beach and walks down and has his morning coffee and uh, I think he's very much the mindset of I've I've run enough in my life that I don't need to do another another step. So fair there enough. is no question that he yeah. certainly has yeah. done enough as a he's runner. Enough, I reckon. Yeah. Did, did he ever talk about it? what I always felt bad about is him getting sick before the 84, before the 1500. Yeah, he did. yeah. We, we speak about those things, uh, not regularly, but it's always interesting to speak about the things that don't go well for someone that uh, had a career that pretty much was flawless. And um, it was a shame. 84, he, he was one of these guys that really struggled with air quality and, um, the smog in LA, just for some reason, there was something in the air that really reacted poorly with his breathing. And I guess he, I it was at that time where exercise induced asthma was not really a massively known People didn't thing. know much about that. Yeah. No. And, and that's something that he uh, suffered heavily from. And, um, you know, with the amount of nerves and stress compensating your breathing anyways, um, it, it really actually was quite a, spectacular performance for him to even make the final in both events because he he ended up in hospital after the final um i realize that yeah he 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 was in a hospital bed and um, they made the decision there with my mom that uh, if things weren't going well in the 15 that he could step off the track and he only stepped off the track with like 350 meters left to go and he was in position to still win the race which think says a lot about his character that he he only ran for the win um but yeah it was a shame because i think um yeah i'm pretty sure he would have beaten seven out of 15 i know i'm a little bit biased but um it, it would have been a nice showdown well and i think he had just set a world record not long before he i mean did he was in Marietti. yeah 83 yeah, yeah. so he yeah. was way ready for that I don't think he would have beaten Cruz in the 800, and I think he agrees with that. But I'm, I think he would have beaten Seb in the 15. So, but he didn't. So, fair hey. play to Seb. <laughs> so, Freddie, when you look at your career, what what's the best race you've had, or maybe the race that meant the most to you? Oof, that's a tough one. Um, geez, uh, I've had quite a few um, sort of scattered results actually in, in different forms. But honestly, the uh, the one that excites me. The most right now is is a steamboat a couple of weeks ago. It it, it really just gave me uh, the assurance and confidence that I'm like, hey, I, I I am one of the best in the world at this new form of racing, and I can actually still got room to invest more time and effort into it, um, which only means that I'm only going to get better. So um, I've had plenty of results where I've run, I've won some races. I was yeah, second in the world at the esports world championships, but the one that really um, uh, sort of changed my whole mindset going forwards was a uh, steamboat the last couple of weeks and, and really set me up for the next few years. I think, you know, what's so interesting about that really, I think that 
when I look at gravel, it's sort of where mountain bike was back in the early 80s, mm -hmm. where it just sort of came out of nowhere. Actually, my roommate back then was a guy named Ned Overend. <laughs> we did Ironman together in 1980. And just watching his career, he, you know, he went out to these races that, that there was like 10 people there. And then next thing you know, there was this whole Norba national tour and the guys winning everything. And but it's you're sort of right at the, the, the ground zero of, of gravel racing. And, and now yeah. it's, with money coming in, there's really no reason you can't be the best in the world. Yeah, and that's that's why I, I mentioned that as my as my sort of result that really excites me because yeah, you're right. And you go to the expo the day before and you just see uh, specialized SRAM and all these bigger um, sponsors yeah. of the team, and you can see that they're just like, we know this is super important. We know this is where we're supposed to be. Um, so when you perform in front of them, then it just sort of solidifies the idea that you're doing the right thing um and and it's like i said before it's just a really fun environment to, to be there with those people those sponsors and just getting after it um because i've done a few road races in the u.s this year i, I won a uh, tour of redlands uh, stage there which was which was great but i wouldn't say it really um excited me and really gave me a, a lot of satisfaction in terms of like when you look at uh, the crowd there there was more or less no one and um the the response I got from it online was, was solid. But uh, when you do well in a gravel race, there's just so many people that seem to be stoked on it and excited about it all around the world. And, and, and that's when you know that um, that's something that you should be doing uh, pretty seriously. I think. Yeah. Freddie, thanks so much for taking time to chat. It's uh, such an honor to get to meet you and love what you're doing. Love what Legion. We were up at uh, in Boise for this oh. um, last year. And we, yes. with a number of our athletes, uh, para, paracyclists, it was a paracycling national championships. And yeah. the guys from Legion of LA were just so kind to our athletes. They they stayed there for, you know, 45 minutes after race, to take photos of all of our challenged athletes. They were really a great group of, of uh, men and women. No, it's lovely to hear. Yeah, the, they're doing special things, Legion and, and the and the brothers. And it, it's it's just nice and refreshing to be a part of a group of people that understand that it's more than just, bike results and there's a community there's people yep. that want to be inspired and, and they really get that so um that's important to me um but yeah bob you're a legend mate i've watched all your videos with all your all the big triathletes and i think what you're doing is is so cool and uh, an honor to speak to you love it freddie ovette has been our guest everybody again breakfast with bob not quite cone edition thanks everybody for tuning in we'll catch you next time see ya <laughs>